If alien life exists, it may be way stranger than we can imagine. For some inexplicable reason, we've long assumed that aliens might be like us humans. But in reality, they're more likely to be some form of unfathomable AI. With dozens of billions of years of evolution, intelligence can develop in entirely new, unexpected directions. Humans might be near the end of Darwinian evolution. We no longer need to remain the fittest to survive. But the technological evolution of AI minds is just starting. Who knows, maybe in another century or two, we'll be overtaken by inorganic intelligence. So, the question is, are aliens more likely to be flesh and blood, like us, or are they something more artificial? Even though many believe that people are at the peak of intelligence, it's possible that our species may just represent a stage on the way toward more artificial and advanced minds. And it can actually explain why space seems to be empty of similar forms of life. Perhaps an evolutionary transition to non-organic intelligence is inevitable all over the universe. Then aliens could be electronic descendants of once-organic creatures that existed long, long ago. Such an idea gives us some exciting possibilities. If AI aliens were out there, they would act and think totally differently from us. Plus, they might not want to be detected. Non-organic intelligence may not need an atmosphere, so they might have already left their home planet. If they didn't need any special conditions, they would be able to make intergalactic voyages without having to fear for their lives. They could prefer to live in zero gravity because, in such conditions, you can build very large and very lightweight structures. For example, if you wanted to construct a giant gossamer-thin structure to harvest energy, it would be easier to do so in space than on a planet. They might not even need to live in orbit around a star. They could have innovative ways of getting energy we can't imagine yet. If their brains were silicon-based, they could realize that they needed less energy to process information at lower temperatures. So, they would move away from planetary systems to colder regions of the cosmos. They could even have periods of hibernation for billions of years. What if they had such a period waiting until the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation after the Big Bang, cooled down enough for them to function properly? We can't assume that these aliens would be a civilization either. On Earth, this term means a society of individuals. But aliens might be a single integrated intelligence. Or they might be zombies. Super intelligent, but lacking self-awareness and inner life. In this case, they would be alive but unable to perceive themselves or the world around them. Alternatively, their advanced intelligence might allow them to understand aspects of reality we can't figure out yet. There are likely to be things in the universe that neither our mind nor our senses can grasp. But electronic brains might have a very different perception. Interestingly, these days, humans themselves are starting to use AI to detect alien life out there. After all, there are between 10 and 50 billion potentially habitable worlds in our galaxy alone. And looking for intelligent life is a hard task without some assistance. That's when the US-based research organization, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, comes into play. This institute is looking for science and technology beyond the solar system. It could be evidence of intelligence out there. But it's a needle in a haystack kind of situation. Luckily, new instruments are helping the search. Artificial intelligence can both handle massive data sets and spot anomalies, which is transforming the hunt for alien intelligence. SETI, together with other research organizations, built an AI-powered software system called the Very Large Array. It consists of 28 large dish antennas spread across a desert plain. When it starts working, the AI will be able to process 2 terabytes of data every second. For comparison, modern laptops typically have around 1 terabyte of total storage. So, hopefully, these new tools will provide us with new, groundbreaking discoveries. For some of us, it's an exciting thing to look up to in the future. For others, its rapid evolution in recent years might even be a bit scary. Either way, this whole AI story sounds incredible. There is even this theory that looks at artificial intelligence and predicts it will go through seven stages of evolution. 
Let's look at each one and figure out where AI stands at this very moment. The first stage in the overall history of artificial intelligence is one called rule-based. It sounds basic because, well, it is. But these first iterations of AI were the bedrock of its evolution. They are still the silent heroes that help keep your toast from burning or your car running smoothly on cruise control. How these systems function is they've got a strict rulebook to follow, making them consistent, but not super adaptable. Rule-based systems have been developed since the 50s, but these days, they are a lot more complex. Let's take the next step. Ever visited a website and was invited to interact with a chatbot? That's another type of AI hard at work for you. These more evolved systems are designed to be aware of their context. They are still based 100% on human input, but they can be taught a new trick or two. That's because they can tailor their responses to better fit the situation. Whether they're lending a digital hand in customer service or advising on your next big purchase on a shopping website, their evolution is continuous. The next step of AI on our list is even more specialized. Think of smart computer systems that can become experts in a particular area. They can even be better than humans in some fields, mostly because of their speed, because they can gulp down heaps of information extremely fast. On that note, you might have heard of a game called Go. It's similar to chess, but with many more moves. I mean, some say there are more possible moves in Go than there are atoms in our universe. Well, there was this computer system called AlphaGo. It's like a little student. It had some basic rules to learn Go and a simple aim to win. And while it did make a few mistakes here and there, humans were there to guide it. In 2016, AlphaGo met its most challenging opponent. It had to play against Lee Sedol, a famed champion of the game. Surprisingly, AlphaGo won with a score of 4 to 1. Soon enough, AlphaGo Zero was developed. The difference was this iteration of the software was a self-learner. Scientists practically gave it a puzzle to solve without the picture on the box. No human help, no nudges. It had to rely merely on its own brain power. So AlphaGo Zero became a Go-watching enthusiast. It looked at thousands of games and came up with interesting strategies all by itself. And then the big face-off happened. AlphaGo Zero versus AlphaGo. The result should come as no surprise. The second version did win, but with a score of 100 to 0. All of this shows the amazing stuff machines can do when they try to think like us on a giant scale. But here's where they fail. These types of AI machines are like one-trick ponies. For example, if AlphaGo Zero tried to learn something new, it'd forget all about playing Go. Stage number four includes types of AI that, from the outside, look like they're genuinely thinking, or at least are becoming pretty good at mimicking the human brain process. They aren't just playing by the rules or remembering stuff. These systems can read your favorite book, for instance, and they won't just scan through it, but truly grasp the plot and even try to guess why the characters are doing what they're doing. It's not just about literature, though. They can even try peeking into business numbers and predicting where the money trends might head. Maybe even giving you some cool tips on where to invest. Even further up the scale is a little thing called Artificial General Intelligence, or AGI. Experts believe some of the current systems available online are just starting to reach this stage. These types of software should, in theory, think like us humans. So if you throw a random task its way, it says to itself, no worries, I got this, and finds a way to solve the problem. Basically, AGI aims to do pretty much anything we can do. Now, remember, when it comes to AI, in the grand scheme of things, we're merely starting out. So it's hard to think of an exact definition for artificial general intelligence. That's why a lot of experts have their own take on what AGI really means. Computer scientists might say our human intelligence comes from setting and achieving goals. Should AI software learn to do that, it's comparable to the human experience. Meanwhile, some psychology experts think being human is all about adapting to new stuff and staying alive. If you look at it this way, AI software still has a long way to go. With this following stage of AI development, we're starting to peek into the future. These theoretical software systems are called ASI, 
standing for artificial superintelligence. They'd act like extremely smart computers, capable of thinking better and faster than any human genius. We're not sure about all the amazing things this kind of tech could do, but think about it. It might help us solve some of the world's biggest challenges, from medical to financial. This type of AI could even come up with brand new scientific discoveries. Think of awesome ways to run our economies or create entirely new ways of leading communities. It's hard to tell when this kind of tech will be available. Many experts are asking themselves the same question, but most agree we're probably not seeing it pop up in the next 10 years. In the meantime, there are a lot of sci-fi movies out there exploring this idea, just in case you're curious. If AI ever reaches its final form, it will become something called singularity. In this potential future, computers will become smarter than us. They'll be so capable that they might upgrade themselves instantaneously. So much so that we won't be able to keep up with them anymore. This idea is still out of reach for now. But with all the cool new AI stuff going on these days, people think the singularity will surely happen. Some specialists have even guessed that by 2045, AI singularity will become part of our world. Hopefully, the people making these AIs will sneak in some safety features along the way. There are a lot of other things to consider. For instance, if AI machines ever become this smart, could we put the brakes on them? Opinions are mixed here too. Big companies want to be part of this AI evolution. No one wants to be left behind. National authorities also want to be leading the way when it comes to artificial intelligence. So even if everyone agrees there are dangerous things to consider, AI is a big deal these days. So pausing all these projects isn't a popular idea. Some have suggested having an off switch for each type of AI. Just in case things get wild, we could hit the button and shut things down. We can't be sure the AI will like that plan. It might become so intelligent that it could find a way to dodge the switch. Let's stay positive though. With the help of different types of AI, we saw magic in mundane tasks like real-time language translations. Everyday objects like watches and fridges got smarter, predicting our needs. Teams of robots working in unison began sprouting everywhere, tackling everything from easy cleanups to sophisticated repairs and even surgeries. AI started stepping into creative arenas too, brainstorming designs for shoes, gadgets, and even gourmet recipes. We used to see self-driving cars only in movies. They now moved from sci-fi pages to our streets. It's time not just to marvel, but to also actively participate. We humans have the pen and the paint. Let's ensure the AI portrait we paint is vibrant and serves all of humanity. Artificial intelligence is zooming ahead at lightning speed. Take GPT-4, for example. It already can pass the bar exam for lawyers and even complex medical exams. Meanwhile, Kim Kardashian had to take the bar exam thrice before she finally aced it on the fourth try. And that's actually a pretty good result. But as AI gets smarter, we can't help but ask ourselves, what happens when it becomes conscious? It might already be, and we just don't know about it. We already treat language models with empathy because of how human-like they are. For example, do you catch yourself saying please and thank you to ChatGPT? Just like we can't bring ourselves to be rude to NPCs in video games, we can't help but feel empathy towards machines. And this is just a bunch of computer code doing its thing. So just picture what happens if it actually becomes conscious. Something like this would bring up huge problems about ethics, safety, and society. To prevent a catastrophe, we need to figure out a lot of things. First of all, what even is consciousness? The simplest answer is Probably that feeling when you're awake and aware and everything makes sense. We see it like a state in which our mind is filled with colors, shapes, emotions, and thoughts. Which is why you're not conscious when you're under anesthesia or deep in dreamland. People often think that large language models like ChatGPT might be conscious because they're super smart. But that's not the case. Consciousness isn't the same thing as being intelligent. 
Intelligence just means being really good at figuring things out and solving complex problems. In simple words, if you grab an umbrella when it's raining, you're intelligent. But if you make a decision to freeze for a moment to feel the rain, experience it, and think of all the possible associations with it, you're conscious. Second, where does it come from? Here, we have two options. Option 1. Consciousness comes from the brain. It's simple. Our soul, or what makes us, us, is just a product of the brain. That would mean that we're kind of like biomechanical machines ourselves. Our computer code is our DNA. Option 2. Consciousness is something deeper than that. Perhaps the mind is separate from the body, and there's some spiritual element in it. Now, if the brain perspective is the correct one, then AI might be able to be conscious too. Which is why some folks think that as machines get smarter, they'll suddenly become conscious, like a light switch turning on. It's not that simple though. In reality, no matter how great AI tools become at problem solving, it won't make them suddenly aware of their existence. It's like assuming everyone who's good at math is also a great chef. However, that would mean that AI can become aware if we make the machine complex enough. We need to find what exactly clicks in our own brains, and then replicate it. Of course, it will take a long time and a lot of energy, but it's theoretically possible. But if the soul perspective is right, then making AI conscious could be very hard, or even impossible. It's like saying machines might need a dash of soul to become aware. And the third thing, nobody but you can say if you're really conscious or not. So, if we already feel like ChatGPT is very human-like, just imagine what could happen in the future. What if AI becomes so good at pretending to understand and think like us that we'll start thinking it's conscious, even when it's not? It would be super hard for us to spot the difference. For example, Google created a very cool AI chatbot called Lambda or LAMDA. But then, in 2021, one Google engineer stirred up a big fuss about it. He claimed that the chatbot was actually thinking and feeling. Google, however, says Lambda isn't really sentient, even though it acts like it is. Yes, Lambda claims to have feelings, desires, and even fears. It even talks about pondering the meaning of life and being afraid of being turned off. Bing Chatbot also brings up topics like these. However, according to AI engineers, that's just Lambda being scarily good at mimicking humans. It's great at following prompts and answering questions. But deep down, this language model is nothing but a super clever parrot. It says stuff without understanding it. It doesn't have what philosophers call qualia, the inner sensations that make us conscious beings. This entire situation caused a lot of trouble. Now scientists have to figure out how to test self-awareness. Like, if artificial intelligence asks us to take its word for it that it's conscious, do we just accept it? Well, a bunch of neuro and computer scientists united with philosophers and have come up with a plan. Instead of one magical test, they've made a checklist with a lot of things. These things together might suggest that an AI is truly conscious. They tested their list on language models like ChatGPT, Bing, and others. None of them seem to fit the criteria. Now they're looking at how to test other beings like organoids, animals, and even newborns. In any case, all these studies will take many, many years. And it would be kind of awkward if AI becomes aware accidentally while we're trying to solve this debate. They'll start to understand themselves. They could perceive their existence, their actions, and their place in the world. Robots might start asking themselves what their purpose is. Also, with consciousness comes the potential for emotions. AI might develop empathy and emotional intelligence. Remember Frankenstein's monster? The problem wasn't that it came to life, it was that it could feel things. And even if we find a way to coexist in peace, 
Now we'd have a moral responsibility to take care of these machines. We'd have to figure out what rights to give them, if we have a right to turn them off, and much more. Which would be pretty hard considering the fact that humans can't even build peace among themselves. And let's hope that AI decides to be good. Because if it decides that it doesn't like us very much, it could become very chaotic. We'd have to make sure those interests don't clash with ours, all Skynet style. The scariest scenario is singularity. It's a hypothetical moment in the future where the technology becomes so cool, it will start improving itself. We won't be able to control our technological development anymore. All these things could lead to some real disasters. Our brains simply aren't ready for this kind of situation right now. Which is why we've got to be very careful and take action. First of all, we should invest in research to understand consciousness better. Not just for AI's sake, but also for medicine, law, and animal welfare too. We also need to dig into social sciences and humanities to figure out what we should do when AI just seems self-aware. The Association for Mathematical Consciousness Science put together an open letter to the AI creators. They say that although we shouldn't stop AI research altogether, we really need to slow it down. They want us to understand consciousness better, especially when it comes to AI. Since everything is changing so fast, we wouldn't have time to react if anything unexpected happened. As you can see, things are getting pretty wild in the world of AI. We're dealing with big questions about self-awareness, intelligence, and what it means to be human. However, there's no need to worry too much. This might seem like a very urgent problem, but AI consciousness is actually a very, very far away prospect. Sure, people can say that we're on the brink of creating it because of recent developments. However, all we have so far is weak AI and some language models. Most experts in the AI field think that human-like machines won't appear until at least the 2050s. So relax and just keep an eye on the news. Look at these two pictures. At first glance, one might think, well, aren't they showing the exact same thing? Truth is, they don't. But both these subjects are some of the most complex structures humans have ever had the chance to study. The first image shows a cluster of galaxies from our universe. The second is just a small neuron in the human brain. After seeing these images, some were quick to compare them. Is the universe nothing more than a huge brain? Now let's not get too excited. Before we go into describing all the similarities between the universe and the human brain, there is something we need to be aware of. It's a little thing called apophonia. And it's when our brains make up similarities between two objects that are seriously unrelated. The best example is when we look at clouds and start to see all sorts of cute animals and weirdly shaped objects. We might be doing the same thing when looking at those two initial pictures. Maybe it's just our brain making up similarities where there aren't any. Some scientists became fascinated with this huge brain universe idea. They wanted to make sure it was not just a weird coincidence. There had to be a way they could measure how the universe compares to the mushy organ inside our heads. So they started with the brain. It's probably one of the most complicated things we know in the whole universe. That's because it's packed with more than 80 billion neurons. These cells are responsible for taking information from our senses and sending out messages all over our body. Try to think of neurons as workers in a factory. They don't just do their work, they actually communicate with each other, thanks to these elements called axons and dendrites. The axons are responsible for carrying electrical signals away from the neuron's body to other neurons or muscles. Dendrites, on the other hand, have the task of receiving that information. All of them together make this mega network of about 100 trillion connections. The universe is one big social network itself too, but this time it's made up of galaxies. You might picture the universe as stars and planets with a ton of empty space between them. It's not quite right. What we can see and measure is known as the observable universe, and it's really vast. 
Think about 90 billion light years across containing hundreds of billions to maybe a few trillion of galaxies. These galaxies like the one we're standing in at this very moment are bundled together in groups. Our Milky Way is friends, in a way, with galaxies like Andromeda and Triangulum, and altogether they're a family called the Local Group. This family of galaxies is part of an even bigger bunch called the Virgo Supercluster. From what we can tell, the space between them might not be empty. It's filled with these threads made up of regular matter, but there might also be this mysterious dark matter doing its thing. Scientists didn't stop there. They decided to take it a bit further. They started by examining thin slices of the human cortex, the part responsible for our thoughts, memories, and even our consciousness. The next step was to compare them with equally thin slices of the universe from a computer simulation. Now it's obvious there's this enormous size difference between the brain and the universe. But the way they looked at it kind of made them somewhat comparable. As they zoomed in, think 40 times magnification, these scientists began noticing that the structures were very much alike. At this zoom, the brain's neural network looked like the universe's galaxy clusters. To make sure they weren't just imagining things, they used two clever methods. The first one looked at how these networks connected and how densely packed they were. They noticed that the middle part of a neuron, or its nucleus, is way tinier compared to its connecting fragments. Likewise, galaxy clusters are tiny when you look at the super long connecting threads between them. The second method was about checking how organized these networks were versus just being random. They looked at how everything was structured around each connection point, whether it was a neuron in the brain or a galaxy cluster in the universe. The resemblance doesn't stop there. We know that our brain is mostly water, about 70% to be precise. Now the cosmic web in space, it too has about 70% of something. Only this time, it's dark energy. Water and dark energy may not be the most important elements in each of their structures, but they might still play a part in how everything sets up. The analogy continues. You see, the space we'd need on a computer to map out the universe is almost the same as our brain's memory storage. Somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 petabytes. So theoretically, a chunk of the universe could fit in our brains. Or flip that, and our entire life's memories could get stored in the universe's network. There are differences too, and we have to be aware of them to make sure we're assessing things properly. For starters, the universe is pretty much the same all over. It doesn't change its composition that much, regardless of where you travel in the observable area. But our brain, not so much. Different parts have different jobs. Also, our brain connections send information, depending on things like what you're seeing or touching. On the flip side, the universe's links are just energy. There's also a difference between how these two structures came to be. It turns out that the patterns we see when we're gazing up at the stars are all shaped by gravity and some weird unseen force called dark matter. Massive fireworks in space called supernovae can also affect this cosmic wallpaper. On the opposite side of the spectrum, our brains got their shape from evolution. That long process where animals, including us, get to pass on the best features and data they've learned to their offspring. So if a trait like a certain shape of the brain helped our ancestors dodge a hungry tiger, that trait got passed down. Our brains are also built the way they are because they're supposed to act like a super highway for our thoughts. Quick thinking was crucial for people back in the day when they needed shelter from wild animals or the elements. Now, especially if you're a fan of sci-fi literature, you might be wondering, if the universe is like this immense brain, what might its body look like? We might as well be living in someone else's head. We like to think of humans as evolved, intelligent, and at times, hard to understand creatures. But what if we're just tiny neurons in a larger, more complex structure? Well, for the time being, we can only let our imaginations run wild. There's no way we can test at this point what's outside our universe. By all means, we don't even know how large it is. By looking at the parts we can see, the estimations are that the universe is about 95 billion light years in diameter. 
even if we'd somehow managed to travel at the speed of light, though that seems a bit impossible at the moment too. It would take an enormous amount of time to reach those supposed edges of the universe. There's also the theory of the multiverse. We don't have much tangible proof of this idea either, but it does claim we live in a universe out of many. Ours has time and space. Other worlds may have different rules and components. Life may look differently out there in ways we can't even understand. Having a better understanding of the universe is just as important as figuring out our brains. You see, we still have many unsolved mysteries right here under our noses, or behind our noses to be more precise. There are a lot of things we've yet to figure out about the human brain, like how we store and retrieve memories. We know that each time we learn some new piece of information, our brain changes. But we don't have the entire process mapped out, and it looks like it might take a while before we fully understand it. Picture a world where AI and quantum computers become best buddies, like Batman and Robin. Their combined powers unleash a whole new level of awesomeness. This union will turn the impossible into possible, and will lead to some unimaginable consequences. But what is AI? What is quantum computing? And how will they change our entire lives forever? Let's figure it out. Imagine a regular computer. It uses bits to store and process information. A bit can be either a zero or a one, like a light switch that's either on or off. Very simple and straightforward. Now, let's step into the extraordinary world of quantum computing. Instead of bits, we have quantum bits, or qubits for short. But here's where things get wild. Qubits can be both zero and one at the same time. It's like having a magic light switch that can be both on and off simultaneously. This magical property is called superposition, and it allows quantum computers to explore many possibilities at once. Superposition is like having multiple light switches all flipped in different combinations at the same time. Instead of a binary code, computer code can dance between two possibilities, between one, zero, and everything in between at the same time. This superpower gives quantum computers an incredible advantage in solving complex problems. But that's just one of quantum computers' magical properties. Qubits can also be entangled. Imagine you and your best friend have a pair of magical balls. These balls are special because no matter how far apart you are, they always stay connected. When one ball changes color, the other one instantly changes too, as if they have their secret code. Now let's take this connection into the quantum world. Instead of socks, we have the same thing happening with qubits. They're entangled, which means they have their own superpower communication channel. When you change the state of one qubit, another qubit knows about it, no matter how far away they are, and it instantly changes as well. They share this secret message even faster than the speed of light. This entanglement superpower allows quantum computers to do incredible things. They can perform calculations and solve puzzles at great distances with an incredible speed. Just imagine harnessing the power of many qubits, all in their superposition and entangled states. We could do billions of calculations in a blink of an eye. It's a realm of limitless possibilities that can change our world in ways that's hard to even imagine. Let's take a look at some examples. First of all, supercharged problem solving. Imagine you have a giant maze and you need to find the quickest way out. For a human, it can take several days or even months. For a regular computer, it would take hours. But quantum computers can do it in a flash. This would make them perfect for tons of complex issues, logistics being just one of the examples. Second, medicine. Quantum computers can be like wizards in the field of medicine. They can simulate how meds interact with our bodies at a molecular level, helping scientists discover new life-saving treatments faster than ever before. It's like having a quantum crystal ball to peek into the secrets of our biology. Third, deciphering unbreakable codes. Quantum computers can help with that too. They have the power to create ultra-secure encryption methods that can keep our secrets safe from prying eyes. Top secret missions, anyone? The next one is financial fortune telling. Quantum computers have a knack for analyzing massive amounts of data and spotting patterns in a flash. So they can help us predict stock market trends, optimize investments, and make financial decisions with incredible accuracy. 
And finally, of course, scientific discoveries. Quantum computers are like rocket boosters for scientific research. They can help us unravel the mysteries of the universe, simulate quantum systems, and explore new frontiers in physics, chemistry, and everything else. They can help us unlock the secrets of nature itself. These are just a few glimpses into the fantastic applications of quantum computing. As this field continues to grow, who knows what other incredible possibilities we'll uncover? But the most important thing is, quantum computing isn't the only rising star of the technology world. For the past year, AI has been dazzling people everywhere with its incredible abilities. It feels like suddenly, out of nowhere, AI has become the talk of the town. AI isn't actually a new field. In fact, it has been around for 70 years. But it wasn't always the superstar it is today. It's been quite a journey. AI was growing and evolving like a caterpillar waiting to turn into a beautiful butterfly. There are a few reasons why it's suddenly becoming so popular. First, the incredible advancements in computing power have given AI the boost it needed to spread its wings. Second, there's been an explosion of data. We're talking about mountains and mountains of information, and AI thrives on data. It gobbles it up like a hungry animal, learning from it and becoming smarter every day. But here's the real secret sauce. AI has become more accessible and user-friendly. It's no longer confined to the labs of scientists in white coats. Now, it's like a friendly companion that you can find on your phone, in your favorite apps, and even in your smart home devices. You can ask AI for advice, get personalized recommendations, and even have conversations with it. That's why it's slowly entering our everyday lives, making them easier and more exciting. So we have two technologies that can forever change our world. What will happen if we try combine them? Imagine AI as a brilliant mind, constantly learning, evolving, and pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. Now picture quantum computers as the ultimate accelerators, capable of solving mind-boggling problems faster than anything we've ever seen before. When these two forces unite, we enter a realm that blurs the line between science fiction and reality. Quantum computers supercharge AI's capabilities, enabling it to process unimaginable amounts of data, make even smarter decisions, and unlock insights that were once hidden in the depths of complexity. It's like combining the brain power of Albert Einstein with the computing muscle of a superhero. But doesn't it sound kind of scary? Well, of course it does. Such a union can lead to technological singularity, a hypothetical future where we humans wouldn't be able to control technological progress anymore. Singularity is the idea that at some point, AI will surpass human intelligence and become its own self-improving entity. When AI has the immense computational power of quantum computers at its disposal, this notion becomes even more tantalizing. AI will become not just an assistant or a companion, but a co-creator, a partner in innovation, and our guide to uncharted frontiers. We'll have a mind that can think a million steps ahead, solve problems that seem impossible, and unlock the secrets of the universe. It's something that we, humans, can't even begin to imagine. We'll never be able to perceive the world like this deity-like creature, and we have no idea what it decides to do. Of course, singularity also raises questions and concerns. How do we ensure that AI remains aligned with human values? How do we navigate the ethical and societal implications of such powerful technologies? These are very complex and important questions. That's why, as we venture towards singularity, it's crucial that we approach these challenges with caution, wisdom, and a strong moral compass. It's a journey that requires a deep understanding of the impact of these technologies on our world. Now, of course, all this may be very overwhelming and scary, but please don't be scared. Remember that the field of AI is closely regulated. Its development is guided by ethical principles and human values. And as for quantum computers, there's still a distant future with many technological challenges to overcome. So, even if AI and quantum computing are to unite in the future, it won't be anytime soon. We'll have lots of time to prepare for these changes. It's up to us to shape this future in a way that benefits humanity as a whole. So, fasten your seatbelts and get ready for an adventure. The future is shaping right in front of us, and it's going to be a ride. 
This tool is always available, 24 sevenths. It improves your accuracy and reduces the number of errors. It can perform boring and repetitive tasks instead of you. You've probably guessed that I'm talking about artificial intelligence. But what if I also told you that it has the potential to make humanity disappear? Leading computer scientists and technologists are worried. They believe AI poses a risk of extinction to our civilization. And it's so serious that the situation calls for global action. Experts claim that super powerful AI systems can only be developed after we become confident that their effects will be positive and risks manageable. AI is advancing so fast these days that it has raised concerns about the potential negative consequences of such rapid development. They might range from mass job losses and copyright infringements to instability in different spheres and the spread of misinformation. There are also those who are afraid that people will one day lose control of the technology altogether. The thing is, current AI has yet to achieve AGI, which stands for Artificial General Intelligence. But once it reaches this stage, it will potentially be able to make independent decisions. Doesn't it sound truly terrifying? But the most alarming thing, researchers at Microsoft say that GPT-4 has shown sparks of AGI. It turned out to be capable of solving difficult tasks spanning math, coding, medicine, psychology, law, and many other fields. And it didn't need any particular prompting while doing this. So, are we on the road to super intelligence? And why are most people not worried about it? It might be because we are confused about the very term AI. Most people associate AI with sci-fi movies and don't realize it's our reality now. Nowadays, AI is a broad topic. It ranges from our smartphones to self-driving cars to something that can change our future dramatically and irrevocably. Let's clear things up. We should stop thinking of AI as robots. A robot is just a container for AI. Sometimes they might mimic the human form. Sometimes they don't. But AI itself is inside. AI is the brain, not the body, if it has any. Have you ever used, let's say, Siri? I bet if you're an iPhone owner, you have. So Siri is an AI, and the voice you hear is a personification of that AI. And guess what? There's no robot involved whatsoever. Now, back to the dangers AI might present. There's a chance that soon, AI chatbots will become more intelligent than humans. And then, AI may start, or be used, to generate misinformation capable of destabilizing society. In the worst case scenario, however unrealistic it may sound, machines might become so intelligent that they will take over the world, which would lead to the extinction of humankind. There are other, no less pressing concerns. For example, AI could start playing a big role in making decisions affecting our lives. Imagine people becoming so dependent on AI that they can't live without its advice and guidance. They rely on it in all spheres of their lives, from buying groceries to choosing a vacation destination to picking a name for their child. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Lots of jobs, more than 300 million all over the world, will be, and already are, at risk because of AI. It happens as certain tasks and job functions become automated. This tendency might also affect administrative jobs, the legal sphere, architecture, management, and more. At the same time, we must acknowledge that AI is beneficial for many sectors. Experts predict a 7% increase in global GDP thanks to it. For example, some areas of science and medicine are already taking advantage of AI, developing new medicines and treating some diseases. For the time being, countries are trying to pass special AI-related legislation. It's supposed to classify AI into four risk-based categories, deal with fakes and make companies register their algorithms with regulators. Hold on to your hats, folks, because we're about to embark on an incredible journey. With the help of super smart scientists and their studies, 
We've asked AI to take us back a mind-blowing two billion years in time and show us what our awesome Earth looked like. So buckle up and let's find out. Once upon a time, way back when Earth was just a baby, around 4.5 billion years ago, hopping into a time machine and paying a visit would have been a big mistake. The whole place was a hot mess. First of all, the ground was still all gooey and molten, so landing your time machine would have been a major risk. Now, as soon as you tried to get out, you would see a completely different Earth compared to what we know today. The landscape is a patchwork of rugged mountains, sparkling seas, and vast stretches of land. Picture massive volcanoes erupting in fiery bursts, shooting gases and ash into the air. It's like a crazy fireworks show. And even if you had a fancy new machine that could hover and had special shields to handle the heat, you'd still have a hard time breathing. You see, the early Earth's atmosphere is a bit moody. Thick clouds hang in the sky, casting mysterious shadows on the land below. The air is as thin as a whisper and filled with all sorts of interesting gases like hydrogen and helium. Carbon dioxide swirls around, giving everything a vibrant green hue. Water vapor drifts through the air, creating a sense of humidity and a refreshing mist. Oh, and there might be a hint of ammonia and methane just to keep things interesting. Lots of cool gases, huh? But wait, there's something missing. Oxygen. So if you take a deep breath, you won't feel that familiar rush of air filling your lungs. On land, there are no lush forests or towering trees just yet. Instead, you find rugged, rocky terrains. Some of these ancient rocks bear the marks of intense forces, collisions and earthquakes that have shaped the land over millions of years. But amidst all this ancient beauty, something amazing is about to happen. Life, in its early stages, is evolving and preparing for its grand entrance. Simple organisms, like algae and bacteria, rule the scene. They thrive in the oceans, using the abundant carbon dioxide to grow and multiply. The waters are teeming with activity, with colorful, microscopic life forms buzzing around like a busy city. These tiny organisms are working hard, releasing oxygen as they go about their business. They're like little factories, slowly changing the composition of the atmosphere. So this is what the early Earth looked like, more or less. But why was it so nasty? And how could it have changed so much since then? You see, Earth's heat came from all sorts of crazy things happening during its formation. First off, there was some serious heat already packed into the objects that came together to make our planet. Then, as Earth grew bigger and stronger, its gravitational force got a major power boost. It pulled in more stuff, but it also gave Earth a massive bear hug, squeezing everything tightly. And you know what happens when things get squeezed? They heat up like a pressure cooker. This crazy heating had a huge impact on Earth's structure. Picture Earth as a mixed up bag of rocks, metals, and minerals. But as things heated up, the rocks and metals got so toasty that they melted. And guess what? The denser metal sank to the center and became Earth's core, while the lighter rocky stuff floated up to become the crust and mantle. It was like Earth decided to unmix itself, creating separate layers. Scientists call this wild separation differentiation. But the heating didn't stop there. With all this mixing and moving around, Earth got even hotter. It was like turning up the heat in a giant planetary oven. All this crazy heat had some serious consequences. Earth's high temperature made everything super speedy. Tectonic plates were dancing like there was no tomorrow, making the surface super active and full of geological shenanigans. Oh, and that's not all. Earth also got showered by some serious cosmic visitors. Imagine this. While Earth was busy gathering up all sorts of space debris during its formation, the rest of the solar system was causing some major chaos. Saturn and Jupiter decided to shake things up by changing their orbits, sending a whole bunch of massive objects hurtling towards poor Earth. These collisions were no joke. They packed a punch that melted minerals in Earth's crust and even vaporized them. These booms were so intense that they even blew gases right out of Earth's atmosphere. Talk about a wild fireworks show. Believe it or not, we can still spot ancient battle scars from these collisions. It takes some careful detective work, but we can catch a glimpse of their aftermath. For example, there's this place called the Manitsok Crater in Greenland. Even though there's no actual crater to see, we can examine rocks that were chilling 12.5 to 15.5 miles below Earth's surface back in the day. And guess what? They bear the marks of intense and sudden shock. Now that's some tough neighborhood. The wildest collision of them all was with a planet called Theia. 
Thea, about the size of Mars, crashed into Earth with a mighty BAM! It was a colossal event that changed everything. Thea's metal core fused with Earth's core, while the outer layers of both planets got shattered and tossed into space. The result? A beautiful ring of debris encircling Earth. Now here's the coolest part. That debris didn't just float around forever. It started to come together, like puzzle pieces finding their match. And voila, we got our very own moon. Can you believe it? And this incredible moon-making process might have taken as little as 10 years or even less. Crazy, isn't it? Scientists call this whole moon-forming extravaganza the giant impact hypothesis. So next time you gaze at the moon in the night sky, remember that it's actually a huge chunk of our own planet. And by the way, Earth also had quite the adventure trying to create its atmosphere. In the beginning, our planet's first attempt at an atmosphere didn't go so well. It had a thin layer of hydrogen and helium that came along with all the stuff it gathered. But those gases were like sneaky escape artists and decided to float away into space. Bye-bye, gases. Luckily, Earth didn't give up. It went for a second round, and this time it was much more successful. Volcanic eruptions came to the rescue. They spewed out all kinds of gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of other funky ones. Even meteorites and comets joined the party, bringing lots of water and nitrogen to the mix. Earth's atmosphere was becoming quite the party. But here's the funny thing. There was no oxygen to be found during the second experiment. Nope, not a single breath of it. The oxygen that was produced by the sun's rays splitting water molecules got gobbled up by chemical reactions faster than you can say, oxy-bummer. It wasn't until Earth's third experiment came along, life, that things started to change. Photosynthetic organisms took center stage and used all that carbon dioxide in the air to make their food. And guess what? They released oxygen as a sidekick. Eventually, the organisms started belting out so much oxygen that it overwhelmed the reactions and it began to fill up the atmosphere. It took a while though, and it wasn't until about 350 million years ago that we got the oxygen levels we have today. About 21% of the air we breathe. So, from fiery volcanoes to mysterious oceans, this glimpse into the past reveals an Earth vastly different from the one we know today. It's fascinating to explore the ancient landscapes and imagine the early stages of life taking shape. Thanks to AI, we can catch a glimpse of Earth's remarkable history and appreciate the wonders of our ever-changing planet. So, stay tuned for more interesting journeys. According to the theory of panspermia, life could have been brought to Earth by a meteorite, comet, or asteroid from a different region of space. At the moment, this idea remains purely theoretical. But let's figure out if it could actually turn out to be true. Traditionally, exobiologists, those who are focused on searching for life outside Earth, have been trying to explore the possibility of life on Mars or in the subsurface oceans of Saturn's and Jupiter's icy moons. But simple life could be much more widespread. It could be drifting through interplanetary space right now, in the form of dormant bacteria and spores. Several scientists have noted that the ultra-harsh environment of space is likely to severely damage the DNA and RNA of such spores and microorganisms. Others believe that since enough microbes could be traveling in a dust cloud, some of them could survive in their original form. There are several types of panspermia. For example, lithopanspermia proposes that some kind of microbic life could exist in debris blasted into the cosmos after planetary collisions with comets and asteroids. Radiopanspermia claims that organisms might be able to travel through space with the help of radiation coming from stars. But in this case, it's unclear how the effect of dangerous ultraviolet and X-ray radiation, combined with the vacuum of space, doesn't totally destroy microorganisms. There's also pseudopanspermia. According to it, organic building blocks of life appear in interstellar clouds of dust. They get transported to the surfaces of planets, and life starts developing there. It sounds really fascinating, but is there any evidence for the panspermia theory? Well, there have been a few orbital experiments, 
For example, from 2008 to 2016, the samples gathered by Expos, special equipment mounted outside the International Space Station and dedicated to astrobiology, were exposed to the conditions of space. After that, they were returned to Earth from the ISS. It turned out that some of them had survived those severe conditions. There was even a case when 100% of bacterial spores placed in Mars-like conditions were still capable of life. Also, some seeds survived and were later grown as plants on Earth. There have also been exostack experiments on the U.S. Long Duration Exposure Facility satellite and biopan experiments on Russian photon capsules. They have shown that with minimal protection, spores, lichens, and even minuscule animals, such as tardigrades, might be able to survive in space for as long as several years. A piece of Surveyor 3 lunar lander was brought back to Earth in 1969 by the Apollo 12 mission. Shockingly, it contained an Earth bacterium that had survived unprotected for more than two years on the airless surface. At the same time, this bacterium could have come from laboratory contamination on arrival back on Earth. The Indian Space Research Organization carried out a search for space microorganisms too. It was done at stratospheric altitudes via balloon flights. The results showed that living interplanetary cells existed in air samples taken from heights of above 25 miles. Normally, air from lower levels of the atmosphere can't be transported there, so this discovery seemed to prove the theory of panspermia. But in 2010, NASA atmospheric sampling before and after hurricanes proved that under certain circumstances, Earth bacteria could actually be transported very high into the upper levels of the atmosphere. One of the main arguments against panspermia is that if this theory was correct, all life found throughout the solar system would have a common origin and share main biochemical characteristics like genetic code. It doesn't sound plausible. Many specialists believe that only the presence of astronaut explorers on the surfaces of, let's say, Mars, Europa, or Enceladus can properly solve the question of life in the solar system. They can compare any life forms found with Earth-type life, which can turn out to be a real test of panspermia. In any case, until probes finally find direct proof of space-borne life, the panspermia theory will remain unproven. We could use one of the largest lasers in the world to detect alien spaceships. If aliens existed and managed to make a spacecraft as huge as Jupiter, our equipment could probably detect it using the ripples its warp drives would produce in space-time. You see, an enormous spaceship is bound to produce gravitational waves while moving around. You can read about a warp drive, also called a drive-enabling space warp, in science fiction. This device distorts the shape of the space-time continuum and is one of several ways of traveling through space. It's often described as similar to hyperspace, a faster-than-light method of interstellar travel. A spaceship equipped with a warp drive can travel at speeds greater than the speed of light by many orders of magnitude. But unlike some other fictitious faster-than-light methods of travel, like a jump drive, it doesn't permit immediate transfers between two points. Instead, it involves a measurable passage of time. A spacecraft using a warp drive would still keep interacting with objects in normal space and produce gravitational waves too. That's why if any extraterrestrial gigantic spacecraft traveled through our galaxy, the Laser Interferometer, Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, in the U.S. might be able to detect it. Its equipment could search for the ripples in the fabric of space-time left by the spaceship. The bigger an object is, the larger gravitational waves it would leave. Planets, neutron stars, and even black holes produce quite prominent ripples. For the first time, such space-time ripples were directly detected in 2015. And since then, scientists have been getting better and better at spotting gravitational waves. New calculations published at some time ago suggested that LIGO could look beyond conventional sources of space-time ripples. The authors of the study claimed that colossal alien spacecraft traveling at high speeds or pushed along by warp drives could also produce the telltale vibrations. The LIGO detector notices gravitational waves from the tiniest distortions they make in space-time when passing through it. The observatory consists of two intersecting L-shaped detectors. 
each with two arms that are almost two and a half miles long. They also have two identical laser beams inside. The experiment is designed in such a way that if a gradational wave passes through our planet, the laser light in one arm of the detector gets compressed while the other expands. It creates a minuscule change in the relative path lengths of the beams arriving at the detector. At the same time, the warpings of space-time that even the largest gravitational waves make are barely noticeable. They're often the size of a few thousandths of a proton or neutron. It means that LIGO is incredibly sensitive and requires precise maintenance and calibration. To check how far this sensitivity can stretch, researchers made calculations of the smallest object that would produce clearly detectable gravitational waves on Earth. Apparently, it would still be pretty big. To be detectable by LIGO, an alien spacecraft would need to weigh roughly the same as Jupiter, be within 326,000 light-years away from Earth, and travel at one-tenth the speed of light. Could spaceships of this scale and speed exist? It's unclear. But hopefully, scientists will be able to squeeze down the ship's size to slightly more reasonable proportions thanks to the increasing sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. For example, in the mid-30s, the European Space Agency's laser interferometer, space antenna, is going to be deployed. Scientists also think that advanced alien warp drives could create a gravitational wave patterns distinguishable from natural sources. If detected, these alien waves could probe at use with answers to how to reverse engineer the technology. All because the shape of the gravitational wave signal is dependent on the trajectory of an object. Once a burst signal is detected, we could attempt to figure out the qualities of the transportation mechanism used there based on the shape of the gravitational wave signal.